I'm Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm the principal investigator on the McGregor Fund grant that the college won two years ago that sponsors our initiative that's called a worldwide learning environment. Um, and as I've said many times, of all the things that I do in the dean's office, this is what gives us the most fun. It's, um, we have found it to be a terrific um, initiative. I, what I'm going to do is just explain briefly what a worldwide learning env environment is. I'm going to turn it over to Tom Nabb, who is our chief information officer, and he's going to um, corral our panelists, each of who are going to, and Heather, who is here, um, talk briefly for five minutes and then we're going to open it up to you for questions and um, with that I'll get started. The McGregor Fund is based in Detroit, Michigan and it funds liberal projects for liberal arts colleges or what they interpret as a liberal arts college within a, a research university. And our, um, our grant is for $205,000, 150 of which goes towards funding faculty projects. The money is all for faculty initiatives. And the goal of the project is to increase our undergraduates' exposure to international perspectives. Many of our students don't have the extra money to be traveling, but we really are aware of how important it is for them to understand different kinds of issues um, the way that they are interpreted around the world. And we have so many talented faculty who have colleagues um, in different parts of the world that they would love to collaborate and this is meant to be seed money to enable our faculty to do this. Um, and we do it through the use of advanced information technology so there's a lot of web conferencing but we also fund preliminary travel so that faculty can go, for example, we have someone going to Denmark in November who's going to set up a, a co-taught course so they can have that time face to face and then the course will be done through video conferencing. Um, our other goal is that these are not just one-off projects so that we are establishing relationships with different universities and institutions around the world so that um, it's not just in the fall of 07, but that these projects can be offered to our students on an ongoing basis. One of the things that we've been really gratified is the connections that we've been able to make between our WLE grantees so that someone, for example, Laura here has a project based in Cameroon and we've found a music ed um, instructor who also is interested in working in a different capacity on that same project so that we can set up institutional relationships among different departments. So far we've given 11 grants and they have supported projects in Turkey, Denmark, South Africa, Namibia, Italy, Cameroon, France, Switzerland, London, and, London, and China. So we have people all around the world. Um, each of our faculty has done a different kind of project and that's um, one of the reasons that we asked them to join us because they all approach this from a different perspective. And before I sit down, I just want to thank Tom because, you know, our faculty have these wonderful ideas and we have faculty review committees who fund them and go through all this stuff. But then when we're about to implement it, it really just all falls to Tom to organize this. And he's just done a fab fabulous, fabulous job for two years on this. We are really appreciative. Um, and that okay? <laughs> yeah, it is, and it's heartfelt. And occasionally, he'll send me an email and say, "Go to room 610." And I did that a few weeks ago and saw a, a video conference that connected someone in Geneva, London, and Chicago with our advanced statistics students, and it was really thrilling. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Okay, thank you. And we want to get to the uh, faculty members without further ado. I'm going to just briefly introduce them because they're the ones that are really doing the uh, educational uh, activities around the world. Uh, the first one will be Laura Hingehold, who is an associate professor of philosophy, <coughs> and director of our French and Fran Francophone Studies Interdisciplinary Program here. Uh, as director of French and Francophone Studies, she and her colleagues received a Worldwide Learning Environment grant in 2007 to foster collaboration and exchanges between Case Western Reserve students and faculty and their counterparts at University of Buea in the bilingual Central African nation of Cameroon. John Grabowski is the Krieger Mueller Associate Professor of Applied History in the Department of History at Case Western Reserve 
and also the Krieger Miller Historian at the Western Reserve Historical Society. He also serves as the editor of the online edition of Encyclopedia of Cleveland History, Dictionary of Cleveland Biography. And he uh, had a class with uh, and other activities with University of Vilkent in Turkey. Mark Turner is an institute professor and professor and chair of cognitive science department here at Case Western. And he has developed uh, relationships, uh, educational and collegial, with uh, colleagues and uh, other students in Denmark and Brazil and beyond. And Heather Boyles uh, is director in the member and partner relations department at the Internet 2 Consortium, which is uh, which Case Western is a member. Uh, she's also serving as director of international relations there, overseeing building of the Internet 2 international relations program from its first partnership in 1997 with the Canadian, and this is an acronym, Canary organization, to now over 45 partnerships with high performance research and education networking organizations from around the world. And when Molly says that I help the faculty realize these, uh, one of the first things I do is check with Heather and our colleagues at Internet2 and uh, other colleagues around the world to help us to uh, set up these connections. I want to say then thank you very much to, to both Tom and to Molly for inviting us here for this, um, this, this conference and to get the chance to talk about some of the collaborative projects. Um, as Tom said, I'm director of French and Francophone Studies, which is not a department, but it's an interdisciplinary program. We have a major. Um, we, also, we also do collaborative research together. There's people I'm in philosophy. There's other people who are in modern languages, history, political science. Um, and the project that we did um, began as an effort to build the program, which provides um, courses to, to, to students who are not necessarily French and Francophone studies majors. Um, the, the, we, the faculty in our program currently do a course, um, they do a summer course, three-week summer course in Paris, um, focusing on multicultural experience of urban Paris. And um, another, there's another one, which is a service learning course in Montreal. And a couple of years ago, um, two faculty came on board with expertise, one from Cameroon and another who's a specialist in Cameroonian um, and Arab women's literature. And so um, the chair of the department at the time thought it would be a good idea to have a, um, to have a course, a three-week summer course, whereby the students could go to Cameroon and take advantage of some of the connections that these faculty already had. Um, so we were trying to build this program, and, um, and, and, and some of the obstacles that we encounter are, um, first of all, that it's a tremendous, we went to do a site visit, we picked a university to work with, but it's hard to work out the logistics in advance, um, and it's hard to raise money for such a tremendously expensive trip for most students. Um, and we needed to create a context so that students um, who were going to work both with our faculty and with some faculty at the University of Buea um, would be able to have you know, some understanding of what it was that they were going to be doing together. We also wanted to make sure that they'd have a chance for follow-up so that they don't just go in for three weeks, you know, have a, a very overwhelming experience and then never really process it again once the paper has been turned in. Um, and last but not least, we wanted to make sure that there would be opportunities for reciprocity and exchange so that students from Cameroon, faculty from Cameroon would get to come here also, both to benefit the students and to benefit their own research um, and their own, their own professional development. Um, so what we did with the grant that we got was we um, brought in an administrator um, and professor of women's studies from the University of Buea, Nalova Lianga. Um, she visited for two weeks, and she met with people who were potential collaborators all throughout the university in arts and sciences, in business, in Mandel School, um, in nursing, um, I, in medicine, and I, that's, I think, all of them, but there may be more. Um, and also to lead some video conferences um, between her colleagues back home and our people in women's studies and French and Francophone studies here. And we had about 10 to 15 um, participants, faculty and students, for each of these sessions. Um, and one of the, the main one focused on um, women's efforts as a political constituency. Um, and she talked about the, you know, the, the, she sort of led the discussion focusing on rural versus urban women's political constituencies in Cameroon, but we also had a 
pretty good discussion, and it was interesting to hear um, the views of the colleagues over in Cameroon about the uh, the, the the Democratic race and, and, and Clinton versus Obama here. And I, it was really just extremely interesting. And then the last video conference, we talked about possible collaborations. And we've come up with a couple that are concrete, um, where, where people will work on a translation of an epic that's available in French now, but not in English. Um, another one, eventually, um, that, that will be a collected book on um, women's constituencies um, that Dr. Lianga is putting together the, uh, the list of contributors for. Um, and, and, and among others, the, uh, the music education project that Molly mentioned, where um, a fac new faculty in music ed who has just done finished her, her dissertation research on folk songs in the Gambia and how to teach, how to teach how to teach kids music theory using the songs that they have learned in their families so that there's a giving and taking, on the one hand, gathering of musicological information, on the other hand, teaching basic music skills so that the, 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 you know, the kids have a, you know, an appreciation and, and, and a sense for the depth and the richness of the, the musical traditions that they've got. Um, so these are all for the future. Um, and they're all, they're all, I mean, they're all, we've got potential ones all across the university. Um, and it seems to me that it's important for these not to replace the travel, um, but to supplement and to create a context that enables the travel, um, as well as to make it possible to raise money in the future once we've got a track record and we can say that we've, we've got these projects underway. And also it helps improve their capacity, um, their technological capacity. So those are the things that we've, we've been focusing on. This virtual learning experience actually goes back a number of years. I first taught at Bilkent University in Turkey in 1996-97 as a Fulbrighter. Then I went back there in 2004-2005 and reprised the Fulbright. And I've been working on a potential exchange between that university and CWRU. And uh, during my last Fulbright visit, it was suggested at Bilkent that we might try to do this virtually. And so I drew up a program uh, for an experimental course that explored comparatively the history of museums and archives in the late Ottoman Empire and Turkey with those in the United States. I taught museum studies when I was at Bilkent, and I found there was a tremendous interest in Turkey. Uh, the museum world in Turkey is rapidly changing. It's becoming privatized. There are a lot of issues about ownership of culture, uh, government control of history, and so forth and uh, came back with this idea just the time that the uh, McGregor grant arrived and I applied for a McGregor grant uh, and was successful in achieving it and that grant paid for the technology and the time to make the course possible. So in the spring of last year, uh, six students at CWRU, all, all smiling there, and, and 11 students, that's the, C, that's the chief financial officer of the Western Reserve Historical Society standing in the back corner, another story behind that, and 11 students at Bill Kent enrolled in the course. Uh, and it worked out fairly well. We, uh, I had several purposes in teaching this course. One was to deal comparatively with a very important issue, and that, that is the way culture is portrayed, given, uh, explained by museums and archives in both of our countries. Uh, another issue was to join students across cultures. Um, my experience at Bill Kent has been very fulfilling. I wanted my students at CWRU to have the chance, at least virtually, to meet students who are Muslim and, and to work across cultures. And, and the third purpose really was to, to test the technology to see how this would work. And so with Tom's help and, and Molly's advice, what we put together was a, uh, we used the studio at 618 in Crawford. Uh, Bill Kent University has a wonderful distance learning uh, apparatus in place, so I was able to easily link with them, but they actually equipped a new studio for this course because their main studio had been fully used for exchanges they do with uh, New York City. Uh, so we had the main studio, and then with Tom's help and advice, we also tried something else, which was called virtual office hours, and I'll explain that in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, the course ran like any other course, although I had to deal with several logistical issues that, that come up when you're teaching across time and distance. One is the fact that the Bill Kent University is seven hours ahead of CWRU. Uh, the second is the fact that course blocks don't exactly match university to university. 
uh, we were able to conquer that simply by scheduling the course early enough here and late enough there that it was an open time block for the students at Bill Kent. We were able to work them into it. Uh, the fact that the United States decided to go to daylight savings time two weeks earlier than the rest of the world uh, during that particular semester <laughs> uh, threw a monkey wrench into, into the project. Uh, the connections technically were quite simple. We used a standard internet connection. We were working, I think, at 386, 486 at various times. We did not rent a landline. Uh, the connection seldom broke down on us. Uh, one of the issues we did have, though, was the lag time between image and sound, uh, which, depending on how it was routed, varied from time to time. Uh, that type of difference makes a huge impact on one's pedagogical technique. I am very much an in-your-face, ad hoc, peripatetic lecturer. Uh, I expect to look at my students, get a reaction, and have them react immediately. Uh, I found that my students in the Turkish classroom, where you can see in the distance, uh, were not reacting as quickly as possible. So that, that was one issue that we overcame. Uh, ultimately, uh, what worked out in the course uh, was that I found that we could accomplish a joint distance learning course. I also found out that having one professor teaching two classes 5,000 miles away is a bit problematic because I had no authority figure in the other classroom. Thankfully, one of the graduate students there came to the forefront. He became my surrogate there. Uh, the other thing I found in this course, too, and this is quite interesting, this is, uh, I'll close with this. If you're doing a course between different universities in different countries, and if you want to use the term culture, there are different student cultures you have to deal with. And I was successfully able to deal with my Turkish student culture because I had been there, I had taught Turkish students, I knew how they learned, I knew how they operated in the classroom, I knew what to expect from them in terms of excuses and whatever else you could deal with. That made it possible. Uh, ultimately, we found the money actually to get the students to meet. The case students went to Bill Kent, the Bill Kent students came here. I'll talk more about that later during the question and answer period. Tom and Molly are great. Um, He's learned a lot already from these wonderful international projects. Uh, our project was the distillate of the intersection of two themes. The first was that if technology is going to work to serve learning, then it has to be at human scale. It has to be something people are extremely comfortable with, thoroughly spontaneous in using, that they integrate into their immediate capacities. We don't tend to think of voice and gesture as technologies, but they are. They're invented technologies, and that's where technology has to go if it's going to work with learning. The other theme is that uh, I chair a cognitive science department. It's one of only seven departments in the nation. Uh, this is a burgeoning field growing very quickly, but given that profile, uh, we have to connect up internationally with the international community of cognitive scientists that looks to us now as a hub. So if we're just local and a monad, we're not doing our job. And there are a lot of pedagogical reasons that go along with that. Uh, so cognitive linguistics is one of our central emphases. But if you want to learn another language or study another language, even though I speak some of them, you shouldn't be learning them from me. You should be learning them from native speakers who can accompany them with the gestures, and it'd be a great thing for your facility if you were getting it from people in your own peer group, and so on. So much of the pedagogy <clears throat> that we have in the United States is exactly because you can't get to where you really ought to be. So what did we do? Well, on connecting up the world, we already had in place a lot of great things. We had everything you need at the high end. We have these rooms, level three technology, that can do H.323 uh, video conferencing. We did, have done a number of colloquia, bringing in people around the world. It's, it's trivial. You punch in the IP number. It's free. And if you do the presets on the camera, then when people are asking questions, you can punch number two, and it goes right to that person answering the question, asking the question, and they're up on the big screen. And the person delivering the answer is 3,000 miles away, but they're right there at human scale on the screen. It's very smooth. But that's high end. That's whiz bang. That's the professor in charge. And the students already have Skype, which they do in their dorm room. 
But what they didn't have was the crucial bit where they could operate in small groups collaboratively doing research, not according to the script of the professor. So we had a video card, much like that, but it didn't have um, uh, video conferencing abilities. And with our grant, we installed, Tom installed, video conferencing abilities. And the crucial part was that we made it immediately available to the students. All you have to, and you can roll it around anywhere in our building, down to the Inamori Center, up to Sage's Cafe, in the lounge. You plug it in for power. All of our students know how to do that. And you plug in the fiber optic, and they all know how to do that. And then there's a remote. And you pre-program all the places you want to go. So now you walk into the Cognitive Science Lounge. And for example, Todd Oakley ran a joint class with a Danish university in cognitive linguistics, assigned the students to do joint research pro pro projects together with counterparts in the other nation. And so you would walk in, and there's the cart, and they are having Danish video con beautifully smooth and fluid. So you can see the gestures, and you can do the interactions in groups of three, four, five, six on both sides. They produced the projects. Um, it was wonderful. It's now just sewn into their abilities. They grab, you know, you grab the cart. It's like a cell phone. They, but you grab the cell phone, you punch the button, you're there. That's what this is. You grab the cart, you punch in, you know, Denmark, Sao Paulo, Nanjing, and you're there. And we don't touch it. They, they do whatever they want to do. Now, there's a big follow-on from this. This was a pilot project. So again, we're going to be teaching another course with um, a, uni a university in, in Scandinavia, and that one will actually be co-registered uh, in the sense that you can take the course here, you can take the course there. It's the same course, um, and the two people are simultaneously teaching it, and the students have you know, desktop video conferencing that they can do from their dorm room. They have the whiz-bang video conferencing that they do in the classroom with the professors, but they also have the cart <clears throat> that they just roll out and plug in. And uh, we, it, the technology is at human scale, and the uh, institutional connection across the students is really going gangbusters. Many of these students are now coming here. Uh, we have four research scholars from other places who are coming here because of what they saw. Thank you. We'll give a little uh, live demonstration of what's been talked about here in a couple of these cases, which is uh, using video conference to bridge uh, uh, well, in this case, not time zones, but at least some distance um, between me and you. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C., in uh, Internet 2's office here. Um, it's great to hear about all of these examples of ways that um, some of the infrastructure that we've been working to put in place, that our whole community here in the U.S., including uh, Case Western, uh, have been working to put in place to support just these kinds of collaborations. Um, and in particular, since my responsibility is with the international um, linkages of the dedicated research and education network that Internet2 runs in the U.S. with counterpart networks in other countries, very exciting to hear about how this is being used internationally. Um, I think Tom has some slides there that um, give you a little bit of an idea of the reach of the Internet2 network. Um, there's a, a map that sort of gives you an idea of the regions of the world that are, are really reachable via this network. It's not a very detailed map, but hopefully gives you an idea uh, of where these networks reach. And when I'm talking about these networks, um, this is not just the commercial Internet. This is, these are actually dedicated networks that interconnect universities, uh, research centers, schools, uh, in the case of the U.S., increasingly uh, rural health clinics, uh, museums, libraries, uh, connects them together in a dedicated manner, separate than the commercial internet, but using the basic, same basic technologies. Um, and, and it interconnects them in a dedicated way then with uh, other research and education networks around the world. So this is really what we're, we're here to support. Um, the, the next couple of slides there that uh, Tom will, I think, uh, flip through, give you some listings of who's actually reachable. 
Um, you know, one of the things that, um, in Laura's sort of example with Cameroon, I wanted to point out is you, you'll find that actually there aren't a lot of research and education networks currently reachable in Africa on that list. Um, but as she said, you know, one of the things that happened there was it was an opportunity to, um, you know, sort of help kickstart and introduce uh, some of the colleagues in Cameroon to technology. And, and I think that's really important here. And one thing I want to point out, if, if you're looking to do a collaboration with a country that's not on that list, um, don't give up. There, of course, there are obviously commercial internet connections, but it might well be the case that there's actually a research and education network initiative starting up. And in fact, um, in many of the countries of West Africa, Central Africa, and even more so in East and Southern Africa, there are a number of places, a uh, number of those countries have initiatives that are trying to get off the ground. And you know, it's the same reason that we've built a dedicated research and education network here in the US. Um, it's, um, it pools the demand, aggregates the demand from the research, teaching, and learning community. And we can, by running a separate network than the internet, uh, the commercial internet, we can really optimize the network and its services to support just those kinds of collaborative uh, teaching and learning applications that you heard about. So, uh, you know, in, in um, um, countries where there isn't, uh, that aren't yet on that list, I think, um, there's certainly uh, opportunities to engage with the communities that are building the networks there. And I'd be happy to um, put you in touch with any of um, my contacts in those countries. Um, I wanted to also just sort of pick up on the, um, I think, the, um, the question about the quality of the, uh, not only the quality of the technology, the quality of the audio and video when doing these video conferences, um, but the impact that, uh, I think as John said, they have on the, um, the ability to actually convey the message, um, to actually teach the class and so on, um, and to get interaction with the students. So, so this is another reason that we're working very hard to connect and improve these um, dedicated national and international research and education networks um, because while the commercial internet, um, you know, is a for the, 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 the folks who run the networks there are in the, in the business of making a profit, hopefully, and, and interested in filling up their pipes, if you will, um, to, with as much internet traffic as possible, what we do in the research and education networking community is actually try to um, keep much of our network uncongested so we can support even higher end video conferencing technology than you're seeing here today. We're running at about, I think, 768 kilobits per second. That's really just because the equipment that we're using, um, that's a limitation of the equipment that we're using. But what's happening in a lot of the community is use of much higher quality audio and video um, using a standard, for example, a standard um, digital video camera that you can buy from Sony or one of the other um, uh, camera makers um, and running that kind of quality video over the network. And this is being used very much so in the performing arts community uh, where while <laughs> because of you know, the speed of light issues, you're never going to get quite uh, absolutely um, synchronous um, uh, ability to work together, but you can get a lot closer and you can really lose the delay uh, in, the, uh, um, in the audio um, compared with the video. And it really starts to transform how people interact over video. Uh, one example, just real quickly, is, um, well, this has happened actually a number of times, but it was, um, uh, saw a, a violinist in Miami at New, the New World Symphony working with a violinist in Beijing at Tsinghua University. And they were using uh, fairly high quality audio uh, video conferencing um, to conduct a, uh, conduct a class. Um, the, the fellow at, uh, in Miami was a violin teacher. And, you know, after a while, you could tell that they had completely forgotten the technology was there. They were just having a conversation musically and, and verbally with each other and had completely forgotten the technology is there. So that's actually what we want to see happen in, 
and uh, with the research and education network and community around the world, we're really looking to support much higher quality um, uh, capabilities than, than um, can be done over the commercial internet. Um, just one final comment on, uh, I thought, interesting, um, you know, bringing students into um, the, um, the case that I think Mark talked about. Um, you know, beyond just video conferencing, uh, there also have been a couple of really interesting collaboratories done. Um, one in the space, upper atmospheric space research community, where um, not only did the researchers, were the researchers able to get together virtually, um, they didn't even use video conferencing. They actually used chat and were sharing some uh, digital visualizations and data that were coming from the particular observatories, um, sitting each in their own, um, at their own campuses. So this is the researchers who would typically get together and do this. Um, but, but actually, before this virtual collaboratory, they would actually typically get together and do this in Greenland. They'd all fly to Greenland, um, where the observatory was, and get the data there, sit around, talk about it, um, analyze the data together as an international uh, research community. And with the advent of using a, a virtual collaboratory, again, using um, chat, having a, a single window where all the data and visualization showed up, they were all of a sudden able to bring students in to this interesting uh, research um, uh, community because they could never afford to send the students, you know, to Greenland um, to when they do the campaigns where they get the data from the observatories. But all of a sudden, they were actually able to bring both undergraduate and graduate students into this uh, research experience. So um, that's a Spark Collaboratory. It's just sort of maybe a step beyond. Um, video conferencing, but I think um, some of the key points here about how um, this technology isn't really about replacing what you can currently do, but, you know, enhancing um, and adding to uh, what you're able to do. So uh, those are just a few comments for me. Um, again, if uh, anybody there is uh, working with particular collaborators in other countries and you're looking to understand how um, they might be able to engage with you uh, utilizing these dedicated research and education networks. I'd be very happy to help uh, connect you with uh, my contacts there. Uh, I have counterparts in many of these countries around the world who are tasked with doing the exact same thing that I am, which is uh, helping to facilitate collaboration between our respective uh, communities. It seems like all of these exchanges going on that were always state-sponsored, Fulbright sponsored, every formal, has just given way to this wonderful democratic anarchy of collaboration. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about whether you think that that, that fabric is that I'm describing is true. And I'd love to hear more about how the personal interactions of these disparate communities worked out on a, on a personal understanding level whether there were sort of cultural understandings built up that, that facilitated the education experience. And I, I might comment on that, because that was one of my primary goals, and to have the students deal with each other. Uh, and one of the projects they had was a, a joint project that they had, I paired the students up as well as I could. And it was up to them, using Skype or whatever, to exchange information about museums in different their respective country, and then to create a paper uh, comparing them. Uh, what occurred from that were, were some enduring friendships, and, and what occurred from the courses, one of our students from CWRU has now uh, applied for graduate school at Bill Kent University in Turkey. Uh, so it, you know, I sort of wanted to put this in motion and watch the students go on their own. The, the other story is very quick, is that a noted museum professional from Cleveland did a guest lecture for me. Um, I told him he was going to speak to students from Turkey, and the camera came on from Turkey, and he looked at me and said, they look just like students. <laughs> and I have no idea what cultural image was in his mind prior to that. But that was what the course was offered. Yeah, let me say that that was also part of our goal, and it had a little bit of detail. Um, because of limitations, we don't all live in the same village. We've developed systems. Basically, professors fly around and see each other. 
They go to conferences, they get to know each other. There's the conference dinner, you know, you have a drink. As a way of establishing communities, virtual communities. Problem is you're only there, you know, three days, four days. You go to Berlin, right? Next problem is your students are never there. And the junior faculty often are not there. So it's extremely hierarchical. You get these, uh, everybody else is under the thumb of the senior professors who know where the jobs are and what the connections are and so on. So could we democratize this, just bring this all the way down? And um, I think the answer is yes, but there's a two-step flow. So for example, we've run video conferences where a colloquium is being given to 20 people in the room, broadcast from UCLA. But out in the University of California system, they had two other spots that were audiences of that, as we were. And by wheeling in the cart in the back, we had the people in Brazil watching. So you have California and Cleveland, which might not seem like a big distance, connecting to Sao Paulo. And now with multipoint, we can do this around the globe. And, and we're just on the cusp of doing that. Now what makes that happen is somebody like uh, me knows all the people involved and serves as the kind of maitre d. <laughs> but if you do that once, then those cultural and social connections float down. And you have to hand it over to the students. They're quick with the technology. They're really quick with the culture. So one of our students is, in fact, moving to Denmark for the summer. I think there's a very strong love interest that's motivating that. <laughs> is this virtual? I'm serious. Well, it, I think it was virtual for a while. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but, that's, but those are the kinds of motivators that are part of an intellectual community. So, and, and so it, it, we do mean to democratize it, but not just by, you, you can democratize the technology by handing them the key. You can't sort of make one big village so quickly. You have to have a facilitator. And now we, we have done it across four, four countries. It's just constant and things are gonna happen and we get surprised. But you need, oddly on the social end, you need a little more facilitation than you do on the technological end. I, w I was interested in trying to get a little bit more about what you see happening with the students. I mean, in terms of them taking responsibility for what they want to do in the, in the future. Um, now that they have this, you know, uh, um, now that they're empowered and they feel this, you know, kind of equal and accessibility. I mean, do they? You th do you see them thinking? easily about the future, what they can do, what they'd like to do. Facts are amazing things. So here's a fact. This course we're teaching in the fall was the student's idea, and it was forced upon the professors. Hmm. We have very bright students at Case. They just take over. They own it, and that's what you want. In the same sort of way that you, know, you ham-handedly can't do something with a new video game or operating system, and they just brush you aside, and because they're, you want them to do that with everything. So they. They know what they're studying. They talk to the students over the various technologies. They said, let's do this course together um, because each of you has a strength. If you teach it, you both get credit. We'll carry it. They're running the technology for it. You know, the, now the professor just walks in and there's a student who's you know, 19 pressing the buttons. And they're in charge. And that's great because it means I mean, there's a, professors only have so much time, and a lot of this is just not gonna happen if you have to have an old graybeard who barely understands the technology trying to run it. But if you can hand the social, cultural, intellectual, pedagogical, and technological freight off to them and let them run, they don't even realize it's freight. They think it's power, and, and they use it. The international community receptions at the Internet 2 conference are just wonderful cultural events. Heather, did you have a comment, and then we're gonna be wrapping up in a moment. Yeah, I mean, I just echo that. I mean, it, from the, I hang out with a lot of network engineers, as you might imagine, in the the building and interconnecting of these networks. But um, and you know, people have the stereotype of uh, engineers and, and sort of techies as being, you know, perhaps antisocial. It is the most social uh, group of technical people ever because they are they have to work with each other to make these networks work across the world and. 
and it's and I think that's true of um, you know a, a lot of things here. I mean, there there are there it's just increasingly true that. Um, research across all kinds of disciplines, uh, particularly in science, dis major science disciplines, is uh, international in nature. You have to be able to interact with your uh, colleagues across the world in order to stay up with your uh, stay up with your discipline. And increasingly, teaching and, and learning opportunities are international as well. And I, and I think um, there's just a great number of good examples coming out of, of these three examples, a lot of the other things that are going on over the Internet2 network and our, and our partner networks around the world. If I could just add one point, that's great thanks to Internet2. Mm -hmm. One thing I haven't talked about is we do a lot of collaboratories. So we connect all the time with the Kosminski Global Collaboratory at Stanford and with a number of other places where we put research teams together. Uh, you know, people working on dissertations and grant proposals. And we use it like crazy. And Internet 2 is the backbone of this, and uh, people have really worked very hard to make this happen. Thanks. I'll just echo that uh, when my colleague Len Steinbeck and I wanted to facilitate a connection between some uh, people at the Louvre and uh, uh, conservation experts at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and a uh, expert in ceramics at Case Western Reserve University, uh, Len uh, came up with the great uh, title of, of Telemedicine for Pottery, uh, looking at uh, <laughs> his uh, famous uh, ceramic artworks. Uh, what we found was that, well, the Louis didn't have a connection. So I called Heather and said, you know, can you find a place for these people to go in Paris? So it turned out that uh, since she has friends all over the world, we were able to be hosted uh, by the head of the French National Research and Education Network, and we didn't have to wait for the loop to be connected. We, we found a way. So I would just echo that it's not about the technology, it's about the relationships first, and then that really uh, lets you either find the technology or uh, it incentivizes people to put it in place for you because you have a reason to connect. It's not the, uh, the tail wagging the dog so much.